In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, once again we want to thank you and praise you for another wonderful day you have given each one of us. Thank you once again that you have allowed us to gather together as one family from different parts of the world. Through technology, we can share our fellowship with one another and also with the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, today once again through the gospel, you have something very beautiful to teach us. As I speak, enlighten my heart and mind, nothing of me, everything of you. Make this teaching as usual, simple, easy to understand. Make it practical so that we can apply it in our life and receive the victory that Jesus won for us. We thank you and praise you for all this, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So my dear brothers and sisters, today we are going to go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. And you might have been wondering why we jumped up from chapter 8 right up to 16, is because we finished with chapter 8, and now there is a beautiful feast today that we celebrate of two great pillars of the church, that is Peter and Paul. And as we celebrate their feast today, we are going to reflect on what actually happened when Jesus posed the question to his disciples, wanting to know who they really thought he was. So we take the gospel today, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19, and we'll begin with verse number 13. Now when Jesus came into the district, of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now here is Jesus, in fact, probably with his disciples, he's ministering to them. If you go to the book of Luke, it says Jesus was in prayer. Jesus was praying, and when he was praying, and he had finished praying, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him this question. In fact, when Jesus was praying, at the end of the prayer, it was G Jesus who turned around to his disciples, asking them the question, who the people said he was. And you know, brothers and sisters, Jesus surely did not want to find out who he was. He knew who he was. He knew he was the son of God. He knew that he had come down on a mission. Why? Because we read in the book of Luke chapter 3, at the time of his baptism, the heavens opened and when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the heavens opened and he heard the voice of the Father. Let's hear what he says. Let's hear what the Father spoke when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan. Luke chapter 3 verse 22. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my son the beloved with you i am well pleased you are my son the beloved in whom i am well pleased we must remember brothers and sisters jesus had not commenced his ministry jesus had not performed a single miracle jesus had not even started teaching Jesus had not even gone to preach. He had done nothing of any value of his ministry when at the time of his baptism, you hear the father say, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And remember, brothers and sisters, God is not pleased with us when we do something good. Most of the time we think that because we have been praying, because we have been fasting, because we have been doing good deeds, God is not happy because we are doing all that. God is simply interested in you and me. He loves us as we are. And that is why when he said to his son, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I'm well pleased, Jesus had not even started his ministry. And the same way, 
You and I can hear the Father's way when we have received his son, Jesus. Remember, brothers and sisters, when you and I become children of the Heavenly Father, we can actually hear the Father say, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. This is my daughter, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. When you understand that, brothers and sisters, you don't need to do anything in order to be loved by the Father. You only need to believe in his son, Jesus. You only need to believe in what Jesus has done for you and me. And when we understand that, brothers and sisters, the Father is well pleased with us. What a promise. Most of the time, you know, when we begin to think we must do something, we must go and do something to the poor. We must, we must do some acts of good acts and then God will be pleased with us. Remember, God is pleased with us when we believe in his son. When you and I believe in Jesus, according to John chapter 1 verse 12, he says when we believe in his son Jesus, we become the sons and daughters of the heavenly father. And when you are a son and you are a daughter of the heavenly father, you can receive every good thing from the father because he's not like a earthly fathers. An earthly father will always expect you to perform. An earthly father will always expect you to do something so that he can really, you know, feel proud about you. He's not going to be proud about a black sheep, but with God, there is no black sheep. God loves every single one who believes in his son, Jesus, and he accepts them in the beloved. And so brothers and sisters, Jesus, was not asking his disciples what the people thought about him because he wanted to find out. He knew who he was. He knew he was the son of God. He knew he had come from heaven. He was just probing his disciples to get to know what their opinion was of who he was. He wanted to know their opinion. And apparently he was introducing them to this subject. What subject? The subject where he would now ask them who do you say I am? First, he asked them, who do the people say I am? Who do the people think I am? And brothers and sisters, before we go a little further, let me give you a little background of this place, Caesarea Philippi. I've actually done a little bit of research there. This place, Caesarea Philippi, was a town about 40 kilometers from the, e from the, river, from the Sea of Galilee. It was presented by Caesar Augustus, the emperor of Rome. Remember, Rome was controlling the whole of Israel. The Roman Empire was so huge that Caesar Augustus, who was the emperor in Rome, had gifted Caesarea to Herod the Great. Remember, Herod the Great was the one who was, the, who was, was in charge of Galilee, who was in charge of the entire Israel during the time when Jesus was born. And when Jesus was born, Herod the Great had received a gift much earlier from Caesar Augustus. And what he had done, because he received this gift, he had built a temple in honor of Caesar Augustus. So because Caesar Augustus, the emperor, had given him this piece of land as a free gift, he had built a temple to honor Caesar Augustus. Later, Herod, now listen, Herod was now having a son. Whom did he have? He had Herod Antipas, who was one of his sons, and he had another son by the name of Philip. So later Herod's son, this Herod the great son, Philip, the Tetrarch, named Caesarea Philippi after himself. So Caesarea was his name earlier, but when Philip, the son of Herod the great, took over Caesarea, he named it after his own self, naming it Caesarea Philippi. And after himself, and later on, he also distinguished the port that was very close to Caesarea, at the port of Nixos, the Mediterranean Sea. He named it as Tiberius Caesar, a port very close to the Mediterranean. Now, brothers and sisters, why am I telling you this? What, what, what is the reason you need to know this? When Jesus entered Caesarea Philippi, he posed this question to his disciples. Who do the people say I am? And they began to tell him so many things. And remember, brothers and sisters, considering that Caesarea Philippi had a history of that land which was gifted by Caesar Augustus, knowing that that place was named 
after the, you know, the emperor, named after the ruler. Jesus wanted to find out of his disciples, if he's close there, what do they think of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Because Jesus is the creator walking in the flesh on this earth. And he wants to know from his disciples who they thought he really was. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when Jesus asked the question in Caesarea Philippi, it meant a lot because you and I who are reading it after 2000 years will always remember that the place where Jesus asked this question is God. There is a purpose in everything that God does. When he asked this question, he's only making them understand because surely the disciples would have known that Caesarea Philippi was belonging to Herod the Great. He knew that Herod the Great had built a temple for, for Caesar Augustus. He knew that Philip had renamed the place Caesarea Philippi. And here the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings is asking the people, especially his disciples, who do the people think I am? And it has got significance considering this place where Jesus was. Verse number two. Verse number 14. Sorry. Verse number 14. And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now just look at the response of these disciples. They were definitely in touch with the people. There's no doubt about that. So while Jesus was actually performing, he was preaching, he was teaching, he was doing all the miracles, surely during this time, the disciples must have been also listening to the teaching and preaching but they were also listening to the feedback of the people. So they knew what the people were thinking about Jesus. Surely they might have been discussing among themselves. The disciples would have overheard the conversation, wanting to know what the, what the crowds, what did the people, the congregation think about their master? And what do they, what do they hear? What, does Jesus, what do the disciples tell Jesus about what the people think? They say, He's either John the Baptist or either he's Elijah or he's Jeremiah or he's some prophet of old. And you must remember, brothers and sisters, the disciples themselves had also seen John the Baptist because John the Baptist had already prepared the way for Jesus' ministry. So John the Baptist had just died a few years, maybe a year, I, I, we can't remember, but he died after Jesus started his ministry. So how could they think, how could the people think that John the Baptist came back to life and Jesus is that man? So it looks like people at that time, probably because of tradition, because of customs or because of their pagan beliefs, used to think that when some prophet died, he would come back to life. And they literally thought that Jesus was John the Baptist. Some thought he was Elijah, some thought he was Jeremiah, or some thought he was a prophet of old. They thought that Jesus was a prophet. He was a special person, a special human being, but they never thought him as the son of God. They never thought him or thought of him as a Messiah. Jesus was the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And remember, brothers and sisters, none of those prophets were alive. Jeremiah died. Elijah died, John the Baptist was killed, all the prophets of old were killed or either they died and none of them was alive. And here Jesus was also there present. So all the prophets and all the, you know, the, the holy men that came, they had already died and gone. But yet the people at that time could never identify Jesus with the Messiah the people of Israel were still looking for. Because the Old Testament scriptures pointed to the coming of the Messiah. And you know, brothers and sisters, even today, even today, even though we are living 2000 years after the resurrection of Jesus, after he came and went back to the Father, we will acknowledge Jesus as the Lord. We will pray to him. We will say in the name of Jesus. But are we really taking his word seriously? Are we really giving Jesus' word the real significance and the value. His word by the power of the Holy Spirit has been written in scripture. The word by itself is complete. Everything that we need in this life 
has already been provided in the word of God. And yet, brothers and sisters, we always want to go outside the word. We want to go for so many other activities and spiritual exercises going outside the word of God when the word of God by itself is complete. Because Jesus has given everything that we need to live in this life, everything that we need to live in godliness has already been provided for us in the living word of God. And praise God for Jesus and the Holy Spirit when we take the word of God we can actually live a life of victory. Most of the time, brothers and sisters, today even, the word of God has been diluted. The word of God is being, a different gospel is being preached. A gospel of convenience, a gospel of compromise. But when you go to the word of God, when you take the word of God and you tell the Holy Spirit, explain to me the truth. Now, that word of God, when we apply it in our day-to-day -day life, God is faithful to his word. God will always bring that word to pass in your life and my life if we are committed and we are faithful to his word because God is always faithful to his word. And remember, brothers and sisters, today, there are so many things that are happening, even in the church, where we begin to realize the word of God has been compromised. For example, we have studied in the previous classes that God hates divorce. There is nothing called divorce in the kingdom of God because Jesus said what God has joined together, no man shall divide. That means if we have brought in rules to divide what God has been divided and God has joined together, that means we are preaching a gospel which is different. Remember brothers and sisters, when a man and a woman are joined together, according to the church where Christ is present, if it is a Christian marriage, it is not a marriage where you sign in court. It is a marriage where three people are involved. The husband, the wife, and Jesus himself. So God has joined them together. When God has joined them together, no man shall divide. But what is happening today? We are not preaching the gospel by telling the people who are in dispute in marriage that they need to die to themselves. There is no dying to self. Is our marriage more important, brothers and sisters, than our eternity? Is our soul not more important than even our marriage? So what are we supposed to preach? When there is a problem in marriage, we are supposed to preach to the couples that they need to understand that if they cannot separate each other, even if they have irreconcilable differences, even if they have, you know, issues which are, you know, either they are, they are, they are biological issues, whether they are physical issues, whether they are mental issues. When God has joined together, that marriage stays till one of the partners passes away. Because Jesus said, if a man divorces his wife and goes and marries another one, that person is going to commit adultery. And the person who's going to marry them is going to commit adultery as well. So where is the gospel? The gospel does not give any Christian to ever divorce. But today, it is the money, it is the position, it is the title, it is the, it is the status of a person that will decide whether he will get a divorce or he won't get a divorce. And brothers and sisters, when we are compromising, when we are trying to modify the gospel to suit mankind without preaching the truth of God's word. We are actually not honoring the word of God. We are not honor giving the word of God its due respect. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when we understand God's word, we understand that without Jesus, you cannot receive salvation because he said it in his word. Jesus himself said in John 14 verse 6, what did he say? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And the same Jesus has said, what God has joined together, no man shall divide. Either we are with Jesus or we are not with Jesus. Either we believe in what he says or we do not believe what he says. There cannot be another gospel. There cannot be any compromise with God's word. And when we understand this truth, brothers and sisters, we understand how important and how precious we are in God's eyes that he sent his son into this world to save you and me from damnation. We will take the word of God seriously. We will not try to 
compromise on the word. We will not try to dilute the word. We will not try to bring in other things unnecessary which are outside the word. But we will stick to the word of God. We'll believe the word of God because Jesus himself is that precious word of God. He is that word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Brothers and sisters, as we understand today, how important the word of God is, how important Jesus is, how much God puts a value, puts, you know, puts his entire name on his word, then only we will understand how important God upholds his word and how much we need to uphold the word of God in our day-to-day -day life. Verse number 15. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, Jesus asked the disciples first, who do the people say I am? Now it is his turn to actually ask the disciples. Because this is what he was actually planning to find out. He wanted to know what his disciples thought about him. Remember, brothers and sisters, it does not matter what people think or what the public opinion is. Remember this, what people think and what is public opinion is a big no. It has got no value. What matters is what Jesus thinks. What matters is what God thinks. When we take the word of God and we apply the word of God in our life, God's opinion is all that what matters. What we think about Jesus, how much we know him personally, his word and have an intimate relationship with him and the Holy Spirit is what really matters. Why brothers and sisters? Jesus himself in John chapter 17 verse 3. I want, I want you to read John chapter 17 verse 3 because Jesus spoke about what is eternal life and eternal life is not a life that is to be lived after we die from this earth. Absolutely not. Eternal life is a life that we are going to live right now because it is all about a relationship with God. It's all about knowing the Father and knowing Jesus Christ. Let us read John chapter 17, verse number three. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And how are we going to know the true God, brothers and sisters? Jesus already said that no one can come to the Father except through him. So in order to come to the Father, we must know Jesus Christ. And how are we going to know Jesus Christ? We are going to know him not by having a statue of his, not by having a picture of his, not by having some sort of you know design made about what he looks like. We are going to know him through his living word. Remember, brothers and sisters, if Jesus wants you and me to know him, then we must know what his word says. If we do what his word says, by knowing what his word says, surely with time, we are going to develop an intimacy with Jesus. And when we have an intimacy with Jesus, we are already sons and daughters of the heavenly father. And we begin to experience the love of the father through the power of the holy spirit and therefore brothers and sisters when jesus posed the question to his disciples and he said who do you say that i am who do you think i am who am i to you he was only wanting to find out after all these months and a few years that he was with them what his disciples thought did they think the same way the people thought did they think he was a prophet of old? Did they think he was John the Baptist who had been, you know, come back to life? Was he Jeremiah? Was he Elijah? Was he some prophet? Was he some holy man? And he wanted to find out what the people who were so close to him, who had begun to know him, thought about him. Verse number 16. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You know, brothers and sisters, this disciple Peter or the apostle Peter, he was a man who blundered when he opened his mouth on so many occasions. He was the man who always opened his mouth unnecessarily and always repented later for what he said. So he used to always feel miserable after he opened his mouth because he was the one who always, you know, 
had a habit of being speaking faster than he was thinking. That you, do you know people who actually speak faster than they think? And Peter was one of those. Before he could think about the solution, he would always open his mouth and start saying some words until Jesus either rebuked him or Jesus actually told him, you know, what you're saying is not true. Like he told him he would deny him three times. But on this occasion, we must give Peter full credit. He was spot on with his answer. What did he say? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, brothers and sisters, this Peter who blundered everything, Every time he's opened his mouth and yet to be rebuked by Jesus every time, this time he opens his mouth and Jesus compliments him for giving the right answer. And what did he say? He says to Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Remember, brothers and sisters, Peter had no idea what he was saying. There was no information previous to this given to Peter that Jesus was the Christ. There was nobody who even came and told Peter, you know, your master, he's the Messiah. He's the one who's come from God. He's the one who's the son of God. There was no information in the scripture that Peter had any revelation. But on that particular occasion, the heavenly father through the anointing of the Holy Spirit who came only for that purpose to give that information to Peter. Peter opens his mouth and he says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And that was the perfect answer because Jesus was indeed the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know, brothers and sisters, the word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos. I've done a little bit of research here. The, the, the word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos and it means the same as the Old Testament Hebrew word Masiach. Masiach, meaning anointed one. So the Old Testament Hebrew word Masiach was also the word Christos in Greek, which meant the anointed one. And you know, brothers and sisters, the angels had already announced the arrival of Christ Jesus at his birth. We read that in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Let us read that. In Luke chapter 2, verse 11, on the day of his birth, when he was born in the manger in Bethlehem, the angels announced the arrival of Christ Jesus. Let us read that Luke chapter 2 verse 11. To you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is the Messiah. In the, in the house of David, in, the, in the David's house or David's city, a Messiah has been born to you. So they were told, the angel told the, 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 uh, the, the shepherds that the Messiah was born. So the shepherds were the first people who came to know that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Now we do not know whether the shepherds were really educated, whether they were well versed with scriptures, but they only were told that the Messiah was born born. Jesus indeed was the Messiah. So the angels had already declared. Now what happens at the mock trial of Jesus in Matthew chapter 26 verses 63 to 66. Jesus was asked this question by Pilate. The chief priest asked him, are you the Christ? Let us read that. Matthew 26, 66, 63 to 66. But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard now his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. So here, Jesus finally acknowledged that he is the Christ in front of the chief priest. When Peter announced to him that he is the Christ, Jesus 
honored Peter. He blessed Peter and he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. So Jesus accepted that he is the Messiah. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew he was the son of God. But now at his mock trial before the chief priests and the scribes, remember brothers and sisters, the chief priests, the scribes, and all those holy men at that time, the Pharisees, they were expecting the Messiah, but they never expected Jesus to be the Messiah. They knew that Jesus was the son of Joseph and Mary. He was born in Nazareth. They never knew he was born in Bethlehem. They had no background that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and Mary conceived him without a relationship with the man. They only knew Jesus as the man. And Jesus never ever told anybody except he wanted to know from people who will really be able to believe that he is special. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when Jesus told the chief priest, he told him at his mock trial, he said to him, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. What did the chief priest do? He thought it was blasphemy. How could this man who is the son of Mary and Joseph say he's the Messiah? How can he say he's the son of God? And he decided that this was blasphemy. The punishment was death. And therefore Jesus died on the cross because the chief priest and all those people there rejected Jesus. They rejected him as the Messiah. And brothers and sisters, today, you and I, we know that Jesus is the Messiah. We know he's the son of God. We know why he came to the earth to save you and me from all eternity so that through his blood, we could become sons and daughters of the heavenly father. We could get access to the throne of grace. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we believe in the word of God, we do not compromise on the word of God. We do not try to invent anything outside the word of God. When we believe it and we do what the word says, we are believing in Jesus Christ. We are believing he is the son of God. We are believing he's that Messiah, the anointed one who came to this earth to save you and me from all eternity. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is so very important for us to really honor Jesus by believing his living word. That's the only way we can honor Jesus. We can honor Jesus by believing his written word. His written word is written by the Holy Spirit. Although men have taken a pen and paper and written it down, it has been written under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Remember brothers and sisters, Jesus not only accepted Peter's claim but he also blessed Peter in verse number 17 that we just read. What happens in verse number 17? Let's read verse number 17. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So this revelation, brothers and sisters, that Jesus is the Messiah, came from the Holy Spirit to Peter. And Peter had no idea about who Jesus was because it had to come by a divine revelation. So there was a divine revelation given to Peter on that day in order to confess that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Even today, brothers and sisters, those who truly confess Jesus as the Son of God and profess him as their Lord, God, and Savior are born of God. That's what it says. When we confess and profess Jesus as Lord and consider him and take him as our Lord, God, and Savior, we are born from above. Just by opening our mouth and confessing Jesus is my Lord, God, and Savior, we, can't be, we cannot be saved. We have to mean what we are saying. He's our Lord. He's our God. And he's our savior. Lord, why? Because he's the one who is the one who gives us instruction. He's the one who tells us what to do. Are we only coming him to, as our Lord and making all our requests to him? Or are we really coming to him as Lord and saying, Lord, you are the Lord of Lords. Tell me, what do you want me to do for you? What can I do in your kingdom? I am here available so that you can give me instruction. That is really considering him as Lord. When we consider him as God, there is only one God, brothers and sisters. We know that none of us are God. 
There's only one God and that's him. And he knows what he's doing in our life. He has created us for a purpose. And when he's our savior, we know that only by believing in Jesus, we can get access to the father in heaven, that we can come in the presence of God through the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, we acknowledge him as our Lord, God and savior, then only and when we believe it and do it in our day to day life, we are truly born from above. And that's what it says in the first book of John, chapter 4, verse 15. Let us read that. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So how does God abide in you and me when we acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. It's not about just lip service, brothers and sisters. We can say Jesus is Lord. We can say Jesus is God. We can say he's our savior. But is he truly a savior for me? Is my life truly being governed by the savior? Do I really believe he has done everything for me that I don't need to perform? I don't need to do lots of spiritual exercises in order for God to love me. I need to believe what he did for me. If he's my, he's my God, I know that he has a purpose for my life. He's the only God. He knows what he's doing. He has a plan for me. And if he's Lord, then truly I take orders from him. I take instructions from his word and I do what his word says. What's number 18? And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hates will not prevail against it. Now, brothers and sisters, let us now, in order to understand what Jesus said that day to Peter, let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 11, and see what St. Paul is saying to explain what Jesus said to Peter on that day. Because we must understand, unless we have a clear understanding of what Jesus spoke that day, we will never be able to ever move forward in this life and appreciate and truly honor God's word. First Corinthians chapter three, verses 10 to 11. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So that foundation is Jesus Christ. Remember, brothers and sisters, if anyone wants to lay any foundation in their life, in the spiritual life, as far as God is concerned, that foundation must always be Jesus Christ. And if that foundation is Jesus Christ, the word became flesh. The word became flesh. The word is Jesus Christ. So the word on which you are building your life is, is the word of Christ. The word of God is the foundation on which you are going to build your life. The life of God has to be built on the word of God. And you know, brothers and sisters, to make this very clear, here St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 11 that we just read, he's talking about Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the chief cornerstone because if he's not the cornerstone, the whole building is going to collapse. The whole thing structure is always on that cornerstone. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 22, again, St. Paul writing to the Ephesians talks about Jesus being the foundation. Let us read that. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone, in him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also build, are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. 
So in order to be built as a dwelling place for God, we have to be built on that chief cornerstone who is Jesus himself. And let's go and see again further what that Saint Peter, the same man whom Jesus spoke the words, what does he say in the first book of Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 9? Let us read that. First book of Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 9. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So brothers and sisters, even though verse 2 of Ephesians chapter 2 mentions the apostles as being the foundation of Christ's church, not Peter alone. It talks about the apostles being the foundation of Christ's church not Peter itself. So that same verse is also affirming that Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the chief cornerstone because it is Christ who is that, is that entire foundation on which the entire church is built. Remember, brothers and sisters, Christ died on the cross. He rose again on the third day and he is the one who is living. The Elijah the prophet died, Jeremiah died, uh, John the Baptist died, Peter died, Paul died, everybody has died. But they will all rise again because they believed in Jesus. When Jesus comes again, when he comes as the righteous judge. Remember, everyone who has died in Christ is right now sleeping in death. And the word of God says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. St. Paul is saying that all those who died in Christ, they shall rise again on the day when Christ returns. And he says those people who are going to be still alive when Christ comes, they will not go ahead unless the people who died first will proceed before these people. So what does it mean? Everyone who has died in Christ, who are right now sleeping in Christ, will be raised to life on the day when Christ returns, when the angels blow the trumpet, and they will meet the Lord in the sky. And then all those who are rest on the earth, they also will be raised up in Christ, and they will live with Christ for all eternity. And therefore, brothers and sisters, the, Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Remember, the first book of Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 says that. St. Paul says that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He has already risen from the dead. Others have not risen yet. There is still a resurrection for everybody to come. And therefore, the only person who's alive is Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father on whom the church is built. He's built on Jesus Christ. Let us read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. So Jesus Christ is the first fruits of those who have died. He has died, but he rose again on the third day, and he's a God who's alive. He's the one who's living. He's not a dead God. He's a living God. 
And therefore, the whole church from which he died for is being built on the blood of Jesus. It has been built on the sacrifice of Jesus. It has been built on the foundation of God's word. And you know, brothers and sisters, Romans chapter 6 verse 9 says that Jesus shall not die again. Death has no power over him. So Jesus is the one who built the church. He gave his life for his bride, the church. And therefore, this church, which is built right now, is built on the word of God, on the foundation of the word of God and on the foundation of Christ himself, who is that foundation, who is that cornerstone. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus is the rock on which the church is built. And he is alive. He's not dead. The others who died in Christ are yet to be raised up when Jesus returned. And therefore, the church is built on the living word of God. The church is built on the living God. He is Jesus himself. And when we understand this truth, brothers and sisters, we will understand how important the word of God is, how important we need to give the reverence to the word of God. If we can obey the word of God and build our life on the living word of God, we are showing reverence to that blood that Jesus died for. That blood that he shed for you and me on the cross. When we understand it was only the blood of Jesus that, sh that he shed on the cross of Calvary that saved you and me for all eternity. And when we believe in Jesus and his living word, we are being saved for all eternity because the word will never change. Human beings will change. They will say one word today. Doesn't matter who they are. And the next day, they will change that word. It happened with Peter. He spoke one day, I am, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And a few moments later, Jesus had to rebuke him by saying, get behind me, Satan. That's exactly what happens in today's gospel. The second part, which we never read today, or we will not read today. Jesus rebuked this Peter by telling him, the same Peter whom he blessed and honored by telling him, get behind me, Satan. Therefore, brothers and sisters, the word of God will never be compromised. God does not change his word. God doesn't change his statement to make you and me comfortable. It is you and I who need to change our mind, who need to change our thinking and bring ourselves in line with God's word. And when we bring ourselves in line with God's word, now we receive the victory that Jesus won for us when he said it is finished on the cross. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when Jesus said, the gates of Hades or hell will not prevail against the church. What was he saying? What was he showing us? The church is supposed to be on the offensive, not defensive in our spiritual warfare. What does that mean? Are we just supposed to wait? We just supposed to wait for Jesus to come behind the walls until Jesus returns to receive us and to save us? Or should we press on to the gates of hell and take the devil right to the gates of hell and make him stay behind those walls? Remember, brothers and sisters, the devil and all his cronies should be hiding behind the walls, not in the church walls, not behind the church walls. The devil should not be hiding inside the church walls. He should be hiding behind the walls of heads. That's his place. Jesus has defeated him. He has been totally annihilated by the blood of Jesus on the cross. And therefore, we who believe in Jesus are supposed to drive the enemy right up to the gates of hell. We are not supposed to hide in behind the walls of the church. And therefore, when you and I understand our authority in Christ, the word understanding the authority in Christ means is exactly what Jesus explained in verse number 19. Let us look at verse number 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, brothers and sisters, Jesus used the same words in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Let us read that. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, while Jesus was teaching, he spoke about Binding and losing. Matthew 18, verse 18. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So whatever you bind on earth 
shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And you know, brothers and sisters, the word bind is the same Greek word Jesus used to bind the strong man, controlling to control the demons and spoiling his goods. This is exactly what he spoke about. So this is spiritual warfare, which every true believer of Jesus Christ must employ. Remember, spiritual warfare is not for people who do not know Christ because they can never fight the devil. They are in the same team. Only the person who believes in Jesus Christ can go into spiritual warfare, can go and do the great fight of faith, can fight against the enemy because Christ in him enables him to fight the enemy. And therefore, brothers and sisters, a true Christian is always on the offensive. A true Christian is always in spiritual warfare. There is no such thing as relaxation for a Christian. If a Christian thinks he's just going to sit tight and he's going to be relaxed, the enemy is going to play games with you. But when you understand that you are in a spiritual warfare, as long as you have breath in your life, you will take the word of God because that is the only offensive tool. We, we already have studied that in the past in Ephesians chapter 6 onwards. Verse, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 to 18. We saw that the word of God is the only offensive tool that a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ has in their armor. So if you don't employ the word of God, how can you fight? How can you be on the offensive? Christians are not supposed to be on the defensive. We are supposed to be on the offensive, driving Satan right up to the gates of hell. And that's exactly what Jesus talks about to Peter. He tells him, you shall have the gates of heaven there where the Satan will have to stay behind closed doors. He cannot move there when you believe in Jesus. Remember, brothers and sisters, the key symbolizes power and authority. Whoever has this key has the authority open or close whatever is locked. If the person has the key, he has the authority as well over Satan. He can lock him, he can bind him, and he can destroy his influence in, in your own life and in the life of people. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus gave you and me who believe in his word the power to bind demonic powers. Remember, when you and I believe in Jesus, we have the power over Satan. We have power of the enemy. Every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ should have the power to bind Satan and every power of Satan. That is the key that we have, the authority to cast out Satan and to cast out every work and to set people who are under demonic influences. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is important for us to understand that this key to the kingdom of heaven this power, this authority has been given to every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we stand in, in, in his presence at the time when he returns again, he will ask you and me, did you use the authority? Did you fight the good fight of faith? Did you employ the key and bind the enemy who came up against you? I already gave you the tools. I gave you my word. I gave you the victory with my blood on the cross. Did you employ the spiritual warfare and fight the enemy or did you just stand there in defending yourself or did you go on the offensive? Brothers and sisters, as we reflect on this gospel of today, let us take a posture of battle. Let us take a posture not to fight against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against people. Our battle is not against our spouse. Our battle is not against our children. Our battle is not against our loved ones. Our battle is not against our boss and our neighbors. Our battle is against those spiritual forces. And now that you have the key, now that you have the authority, now that you have the knowledge of who you are in Christ, you can bind that power of Satan with the authority that you have in Christ. And no demonic powers can mess around with you. You can drive them right up to the gates of hell. And therefore, brothers and sisters, we must understand who we are in Christ. If we do not understand this truth of who we are, we will try to take comfort in some other philosophy. We'll take comfort in other things and not take responsibility for what God has given to us. Remember, if you are a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the responsibility to get into battle. 
you have the responsibility of what God has given to you. Because if you can just shirk your responsibility and blame everything else for what is going on in your life, there is a time coming when the Lord is going to ask you and me, and he's going to ask you and say, did you do what I told you to do? Then welcome into your father's joy. Welcome into the kingdom of God. And if you have just been, you know, just taking a shield and only been on the defensive, trying to play a game of hide and seek, I tell you, brothers and sisters, you are living a defeated life. And a defeated life is not for a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are called to be winners. We are called to be victorious. We are conquerors in Christ Jesus because our master has conquered Satan. He has conquered death. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the understanding of your word. Today, Lord, we understand that the keys of the kingdom of heaven has been given to each one of us who believe in your word. When we believe what, who and what we are in Christ Jesus, we can take this authority and destroy the power of Satan. And we can also be, allow so many people who have been bound by the enemy because they don't know the truth of God's word to be set free and bring them into the kingdom where there is love, joy, peace, and every good thing. Father God, as you have given us the understanding of your word, help us to truly give reverence to the word of God. Help us to honor your son Jesus by doing his living word. And help us each day to receive the victory, the live the victorious life, live the abundant life, live the full life that Jesus promised us. We thank you and praise you, Father, for all this. In the glorious name of Jesus, amen.